In 2018, I decided to leave Brooklyn for the Hudson Valley. I got a new place upstate, and so I put my co-op apartment in Bay Ridge on the market. I loved that apartment. It was far from the city, but it had a beautiful view of the Verrazano Bridge, and Bay Ridge is a delightful neighborhood with some excellent restaurants, including my favorite in all of New York City, Tannerine. If you live in New York, hop that R train to 77th Street and save room for the canafe, which is shredded phyllo dough, sweet cheese, baked all crispy, and then covered in orange blossom syrup and pistachios. It'll blow your mind. Mind. Anyway, my Bay Ridge apartment was on the fourth floor, and in 2017, a new neighbor moved in downstairs. Let's call her Eleanor. I, it wasn't long after she moved in that she started to complain about the noise I was making upstairs. Generally speaking, I'm a really quiet apartment dweller. I don't wear shoes indoors. I have rugs everywhere. I don't watch a ton of television. When I do, I keep it low and watch it at reasonable hours. If I listen to music, it's used almost always with headphones on, and I'm rarely on the telephone. But Eleanor had complaints about the noise upstairs. She wasn't the reason I left the apartment, but I was happy to get away from her. So in 2018, I moved upstate full-time, rarely even returning to the co-op while it was being put on sale. Yet I would still get emails from Eleanor asking me to keep it down upstairs. And I would say, it must be another neighbor. I'm not even there. One time, my brother-in-law and his daughter came to New York City, and I let them stay in my apartment. I emailed Eleanor a heads up that they were coming in for four days beginning on Thursday and assured her that I had asked them very clearly to be super quiet. Well, Thursday arrived, and I get an email around 3 o'clock from Eleanor saying that my brother-in-law and niece were making way too much noise. I looked at my brother-in-law's itinerary. Uh, they were still in the air. Their plane wasn't scheduled to land till 6.00. So over the next couple of months, Eleanor would occasionally email about the noise upstairs. She was hearing footsteps, she was hearing footsteps, phones ringing in the middle of the night, and people talking too loudly. I finally had to tell her that if she was certain it was coming from my apartment, then she either needed to call the police or the Ghostbusters because no one was in there. A year later, we finally sold the apartment to a Brooklyn firefighter, and my realtor assured me it was a slam dunk. But then the buyer did not pass the interview with the co-op board. Eleanor was on the co-op board. I had my suspicions why this happened, so I googled the buyer's name, and he was young, handsome. He literally was featured in one of those sexy firefighters' calendars. And by the looks of him, he was built like a middle linebacker, like 6'4", 220. Eleanor didn't want Mr. Heavy living above her. That is why he failed the co-op board interview. It took almost a year, but I finally sold the place to a five foot eight accountant named Arthur, he passed the board interview just fine. All I'm saying is Brooklyn is a great place to live. But as I and Allison Parker from the 1977 horror thriller The Sentinel can attest, your experiences may vary depending on your neighbors. Hi, Cecil. Hi, Jeffrey. Do you ever have a nightmare neighbor? I think I was that nightmare neighbor. <laughs> I think we've had this conversation before. No, Were you the I, I, loud stereo guy? Were you dancing? Were you learning tap dance? No, no, okay. no, no. I, I don't think I've ever had like a nightmare neighbor. Now that I think about it. Um, I've had like neighbors that I'm like, oh, they're really loud, but like it's just the sound of their footsteps and I live in cheap apartments. You know, you're like, they're just walking. They're not being it's like, like they're just living. I can't yeah. be mad at them. I'm more mad at like, oh, this fucking apartment is so loud. You I think know? that's the thing with city dwelling. People. Yeah, like you live in a city apartment, it's just going to be noisy. And obviously, there's a point where yeah. somebody is excessive and uh, going over the edge. But you're sort of used to like somebody's watching TV and it's kind of loud, or they're on the phone, or they're a little clumpy. Um, I don't know. It's just how it is. Uh, it's sort of thing, but yeah. yeah, that was my first case of feeling like super harassed by a person for something obviously rough. could not control. Um, so yeah, I, I had a lot I, of I had friends. I had friends in a very similar situation to you, where it's like the 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 you know the crotchety old lady who just they're like they're like we're just talking. It's like two o'clock. We're just talking. You can't be so they would just bang on the floor right back. See, you took the nice approach. Uh -huh. They were like, oh, you want loud? Oh, well, all right. <laughs> we'll shout right back at you. Uh, this movie, Cecil, uh, I feel like I, I think it delivered as promised that we got something very 70s. Uh, this is the most. The I most love 70s. This movie has so many famous people in it, either before they were famous or after they were famous. Yeah, Eli Wallach is in this movie. And then uh, Jerry Orbach just plays director director uh christopher walken 
um, as just, you know, like guy, detective guy who doesn't really say too much. Uh, Jeff Goldblum uh-huh. as as photographer. Swarthy photographer. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But then also like Ava Gardner, Jose Ferrer, John Carradine. This is Burgess Meredith, Burgess Meredith. Come on. I feel like this movie is very much like the psychic sister to Burnt Offerings. I could see that. I could absolutely see that. In fact, uh, I believe the director of this film uh, had done, uh, Michael Winner had done uh, several movies with, oh, uh, what's th- what's our man's name from uh, from Burnt Offerings? What's our oh, actor's yeah. name? Um, uh, who's our lead? John, John Oliver. Not John Oliver. <laughs> Oliver Reed. <laughs> Oliver Reed, that's it. Um, so I do. Th- 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 there is there is that sort of connection there. But yeah, yeah this is a very classic seventies, spooky, creepy horror thriller. More yeah, thriller right. than horror, but it does. It man, it gets into some horror-y things it's later crazy. in the film. This movie is crazy. Um, and also, we forgot another before they were famous is Beverly D'Angelo. Maybe Listen in here. the finest scene I have watched on this show. This is this is her film debut. Amazing. Beverly D'Angelo. Like, where would we be? Who knew? Who knew when we started this podcast all these years ago? And you're like, I don't like horror movies. Horror movies are scary and dumb. And I was like, <laughs> yes, but you could, if you go with me, you could get Beverly D'Angelo in red ballet tights. As a satanic lesbian sister masturbating on a couch, staring down up the camera for like a good three minutes. Uh, just just perfect. Just absolutely perfect. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk. Let's get into this movie and what The Sentinel is all about. It's funny that the title doesn't really give you a lot of information as to what no. this movie is going to be. We don't actually really learn what the Sentinel is until pretty late in the film. But uh we get a sense pretty early on this is going to be your very 1970s satanic pre-satanic panic. Uh-oh. Um oh What's we're that just not... Catholic. What's that Catholic church up to? Oh my god. This It's really weird like we've talked about this before with demon movies. Uh, like possession movies, demon movies. You know, I have seen The Exorcist. I watched it as a kid. I watched it with my stepbrother and I found it hilarious. I'm not trying to be Beetlejuice here. I just mean to say that like, it was so ridiculous. And I watched it with a older teenage brother who, uh, stepbrother who was also just uh, being a turd and finding it all hilarious. But also it was a thing where like, I'm just not super into the churchy stuff. And so part of me is like, that's not real. <laughs> the secret cabals yeah. within the Catholic. The, wait, are you telling me there's a church within the church? This is crazy. And Jeffrey, I get it. I get it mm-hmm. from, from shot one. It's like, okay, so shot one is like Northern Italy and it's grape fields and it's palazzos and then goats and, and, yeah. uh, goats and then, you know, a bunch of like, you know, swarthy men standing limo drivers. And then we see some priest full robes a flying. And I was like, literally i wrote gown (laughs) i under i get it man i'm not catholic either and i'm like okay okay so there's some sort of this is going to be all about the gowns the Uh various gowns you get from the catholic church and sure enough this this gown is going into a meeting with a whole bunch of even glitterier glitterier gowns yeah and they say some latin and something 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 the sentinel and you get the idea that this is, oh, okay, this is our secret within the church. You know, something, the secret cabal is yeah. meeting. Yeah, and they're they're chanting this phrase, like, uh, no evil thing. It's like a, like a mantra, a prayer sort of yeah. thing of, like, no evil thing approach or enter in, they keep saying. And then there's this... Uh, this guy who I didn't learn his name till later, but I'm just going to call him the man in black. Like there's just creepy guy sure. in, in the black robes who's sitting in the congregation. Yeah. And he just says, there is danger. <laughs> and then we cut to Central Park, New York. And City. then it's like gorgeous Central Park day. This movie is so like secondhand Rosemary's baby. And in oh, a lot yeah. of ways. And it's, I think, I, I did a dive into uh, the the filming of this, and apparently it was like a very successful book, very much like Rosemary's Baby, very much like The Exorcist, you know, and they, when they went to go film it, they picked the guy who directed Death Wish, because mm-hmm. Death Wish was super popular, and 
every single actor hated that dude. Everyone hated him. <laughs> hated the lead actress. Hated hated the hated, hated them all. Hated hated uh, Chris Sarandon. Hated hated everything. Yeah. Um, so this movie ends up becoming this sort of like like sledgehammer in the face of Rosemary's like which you know version of the scalpel that is Rosemary's baby. Yeah. But hey, it, we have a successful young couple living it, doing it, making it in New York City, man. Yeah, we've got Allison and Michael. Michael, the lawyer with his uh, yeah. sharp, you know, tall, thin, sharp silver suit. And he's got a little mustache. He's just mm -hmm. uh, and then we've got uh, Allison Parker, who is also a, a wispy, tall, beautiful model. Uh, she we we open with shots of her throughout New York City and in different studios and Central Park doing various photo shoots. And we know she's done high level. She is a high level model, Cecil, yeah. because there is one point where she goes to show her portfolio to somebody. And one of the things in her portfolio is the cover of People magazine with her clearly on the front. And it says Allison Parker on the name yeah. on. And I'm like, if you have reached the point where your name and full photo are on the cover of the only thing on the cover of People magazine, you do not have to show your portfolio anymore. That's right. That's yeah, how yeah, this yeah. works. I think I think that was somebody again, somebody in the uh, the the creative department was just like, I don't know. She's the winner of people. She's she's the hundred sexiest people of the year. I don't know. <laughs> but she is definitely the it girl. Yes. And I kind of love this little montage, this like f f photo shoots around New York City, because we all know that the late 1970s, New York City fashion really was like the height of every like it was a time and place. Um but it's kind of fun. They're like, it's it's kind of kooky, you know, very much like, look at this fun game, like all these sexy, like how what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and they this this is not the taxi version of New York. This no. is a, a much sexier, much more appealing. Like this is this is the New York. This is uh, maybe more Woody Allen's New York, right? Like this yeah. is like 70s, 80s. Um, like literally, like any hall was being made. At the same time, with at least two of the same actors that are in this movie, <laughs> yeah. Um, I love it. I, I obviously we've talked about this before. I love anything with New York City in it, like it's old school New York City. It's really fun yeah. to see it. Such a and beautiful, perfect backdrop, you know. And also because we get um we get Brooklyn Heights. We don't see a lot of Brooklyn in these old movies. Uh, we have Saturday Night Fever is one of the few examples that comes immediately to mind. Sure. Um, but we get to see a little bit of Brooklyn Heights, which is really yeah. cool. And Saturday Night Fever, by the way, the apartment I mentioned in the intro, the opening helicopter shot of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn from Saturday Night Fever, you can see into my bedroom window <laughs> of oh, wow. that apartment. Wow. Uh, I wasn't in there because it was 1977. <laughs> like not, I was not there yet. So now what's um, going on with this relationship? Because this is it is a very it's a very modern Yes. Like, I'm okay, you're okay kind of relationship this couple has, I think. It's very it's very much dealing with this new boomer idea of oh well we have the we had the sexual revolution. Yep. Has has already happened. And we're kind of in career gal mode, right? Like we're in the the era where where women are entering the workforce a lot more. Divorce is on the rise because of yep. the notion that people are getting married later. And here you have this young kind of power couple. They're both very wealthy and mm -hmm. successful at their jobs. They're looking at apartments that cost in Manhattan that cost uh, the one he looks at is a thousand dollars a month, which sounds cheap, but in 1977 prices, that is $4,980. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's still cheap. $5,000 isn't going to get you that nice of an apartment in that, that he looked at in Manhattan, but in, in central park, but it's right, still right, right. going to get you a good apartment. Yeah. Um, so they they're wealthy, right? Uh, they're they're doing great, and um, but they they're they've been together for a year or so. Yeah, and she still doesn't want to get married. He wants to get married. He wants to get she, married. He's like, you're you're at my apartment all the time, baby. Why don't you just move in? And she's like, mm, I need my own space. She tells her friend Jennifer, like, I still need uh, maybe another year. Like, I still need yeah. a little bit of time. I just want an apartment for myself for a little bit. And, uh, and boy, does she find she finds a good one. She, she finds an apartment for life, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, she's she still is kind of just not quite on board with with this marriage thing to Michael. We're yeah. gonna learn a little bit about halfway into the movie that Michael was previously married. Now, this is so bananas. It, okay, please unravel this for me because listen, y'all, this movie is all kind of all over the map when it comes to plot. <laughs> Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, apparently when it was released, it was released without the Catholic Church being mentioned, and they just sort of made up a secret name, and then they released it without any nudity. So, like, this movie is crazy. But, okay, so so Michael had this ex-wife, and she may – she definitely fell off the George Washington Bridge. Yes. But it is – the cops say it's questionable as to whether she was pushed or who did it or mm -hmm. if she did it. Kind and of a weird thing. Stuff kind of slowly comes out, like about you know third or halfway through, we hear her kind of subtly mention uh, to him, like oh, I don't want to get married yet because it, it's it's only been two years since Karen. Yeah, and so yeah, this this notion that he's been married before, and you think, oh, are we going to talk about divorce? Uh oh, uh oh. The other but, thing that's happening that I want to mention that that uh, that I find really fascinating. This movie does seem aware of this happening. Like it's it's not just casually sexist, but uh, when they go to look at apartments, when Michael goes, they go separately. They're both looking at separate apartments, and Michael's sure. looking at one. And the realtor guy says, uh, "Oh, so you're married." Are you two married? And he says, uh, "Well, no, not yet." And you see the look on the realtor's face of like, "Oh." not married yeah <laughs> and the same yeah. thing kind of happens when she's looking around and a realtor asks her of like oh you're not married oh you must be a model <laughs> like that just yeah, said, know, that right? like kind of leap but yeah there is that feeling of you're a woman and you're a man and you're moving in together it doesn't seem quite right that you would do so in a yeah why would you do, why are you doing this by yourself yeah why are you alone in this world I mean, but it, this can't be a choice. You can't just live with somebody and not marry them. Oh, my goodness. But, of course, it's not going to matter because she's going to get a place on her own. Yeah, she is. But uh, not before she gets a phone call from her mother to find out her dad is in the hospital. Oh, no. And we, the man who plays her father in this movie, is acting, all capital fucking, letters. Fucking terrifying. <laughs> I don't know what he's dying from. I don't know if they ever say what he dies of, but it seems to be like giant worms eating him from the inside because he is just yeah. writhing all over this hospital. Bed. Yeah, like 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 arms like up around. Like he looks like you know what he looks like. He looks like when Voldemort is found underneath that fucking turnstile <laughs> in, in in heaven version of Saint. King's Cross Station. Mm -hmm. That's what this guy looks like, and it is shocking because you're like, "Oh no!" Oh, you know, like we're like, "Oh, Manhattan!" Oh no, babe, I gotta go. Oh, my dad, I'm so sad. And it cuts to like mom look looking worried, and 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 you know, Allison just sort of looking numb, and then it cuts the guy, and he is he's baby Vol he's creepy baby Voldemort. <laughs> I found it shocking. And I did then, too. And then it cuts to. Allison sitting in a chair and she's like, that's fine. I'm fine. I, I must have just passed out. And everyone else is in black. So like dead. You're at we've, we've now the funeral and already Allison is starting to get these. What is this kind of this sort of uh like what to do when your ailment is non-specific <laughs> and you just sort of, I don't know, just like tap out every once in a while. Allison is going to tap out quite a bit in this film. She's going to tap out into glass windows. Mm -hmm. She's going to tap out like onto the floor dramatically. It's it's a thing she does really well. This movie goes nowhere with that. It doesn't. That plot point no, it doesn't. doesn't mean anything. No. It never Be connects. It, no. it I mean like at one point she gives her boyfriend Michael some monogrammed cufflinks and they come back later, right? Like yeah. you introduce the cufflinks barely, I know this yes. barely, but I mean they come back later so she knows he's dead. Spoiler. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you're going to get to it anyway. But the um but there there's just always something like you're going to introduce she has it's it's they the symptoms are specific. She gets a sharp yeah. pain at the base of her skull. Uh-huh. She and gets like, like woozy and then she just fucking conks out. And when she yep. comes to, she's, she's fine. fine. Well, I, well, I mean, you're not fine. Passing out is not just about the 
whatever on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, Passing yeah. out is also about the injuries you suffer when you fall, oh <laughs> like God. knocking yeah, teeth true. out, cutting skin, you know, breaking yeah, yeah, your yeah. hand. Yeah, um, like what if you, God forbid, like fell into like a subway yeah. frame, you know? Yeah. But it's also like, are they the Satanists? Is it, is it the, is it somebody putting a curse on her? Who's doing Never this? Never explained. Never, Never. explained. Mm -mm. So she, uh, she's at this funeral. Everybody's left and she's going to just wander around the house yeah. a little bit. Oh now God. she has a vision of her younger teenage self. Okay. I love Come. it when films do this. I love it. This is like the weirdest, mm -hmm. low budgetest way to do it. Like you don't even do a flashback. Like she's standing there and she sees, you know, like, a Catholic school girl version of herself with long brown hair kind of run. And she's like, Oh, that's me, you know? Mm -hmm. And what the fuck <laughs> has gone on in this house? <laughs> I was not prepared for what she was going to see. What here. does she see? <laughs> well, she sees herself walking in on her dad, uh -huh. having an orgy yeah. with two, just laughing, shoving food all over each other. Cake. Just birthday cake. cake, birthday cake, black just... cat, black cake, black and white cat, black and white cake. <laughs> just, just fuck until the cows come home, screaming and laughing. And she walks in, she's like, oh, Daddy. And he, and he like, like, mm -hmm. heaves the lamp at her or something, right? Yeah, he like slaps the shit out of her. Like yeah. he comes at her and he's like, you get out of here, slap, slap, slap. And then she's wearing a little crucifix necklace and he like tears it off yes. of her. And she runs down the hallway mm -hmm. and she immediately gets a razor and cuts her wrist. And then dad with the two orgiists mm -hmm. are now in that, in the, the span of like 60 seconds must have been like, oh, maybe this was a bit much. <laughs> because they seem to want to go investigate and they seem you know he's dad's put on a robe at least um and you know it's just like very like dramatic and she's like lying on the floor yeah and then she comes to and we're in the present day what the fuck what is happening in this family what is going on in this family <laughs> leland uh, i i, I thought was the only thing i could think of was like this girl needs so much therapy Oh my like, god, yeah. And also she is the kind of person that will like be unable to go to a child's birthday party <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of her life cuz she's uh -huh. like no, it just reminds me of the time my dad had that orgy with those two those two women <laughs> that just stared blankly at me. And also like what did the dad say? He was said something like don't go opening doors in this house or something like that like <laughs> Listen, dad, I know you're insanely rich. Uh -huh. because you clearly that's the other thing is like i thought they were in like a church or like not a church but like a funeral home no because but they're, they're in their in like this, dad's like countryside manor this is some like manor house and it took is... me a minute to realize oh you just grew up like crazy wealthy yeah like one percent wealthy yeah yeah you're so, you're yeah, not gonna you... have an issue with a thousand dollar a month apartment no <laughs> you know, it's just no but okay. it's just like, Dad, if you're going to have your, like, birthday cake up the hoo-hoo orgy, uh -huh. at least, like, use, like, the out, like, one of the small, like, the, the the sea house, I don't know, whatever rich people have, one of the, like, a door that locks is all I'm saying. Lock your door or, like, do it at a time that your child's not coming home from school that oh afternoon. <laughs> like, oh my God, hey, man. ladies, um, my, my daughter gets out of school <laughs> at three o'clock, so, uh. You know, let's uh, let's do this at 11 a.m. Yeah, I like, don't know. Or, no, we just got to have it wrapped up by 10 a.m. So I can, you know, yeah. squeegee the frosting and lube off of everything <laughs> yeah. when my wife and child get home. OK, so, Alice, so it's clearly she's got a past is all she, we're saying. Yes, she definitely has a past. So um, Allison, basically, as Michael, Michael's gone off, she, he's gone off to Albany, where we, we get a sense that, you know, as a lawyer, he's defending a lot of seedy clients. Yeah, we will learn later, probably because he himself is quite seedy as a lawyer. But um, he's gone off to Albany to do some trial or whatever. And, and he's gonna be gone for a couple weeks. And she's like, you know what, fuck it, I'm getting an apartment. Yeah. And she finds an ad for a an apartment in Brooklyn Heights with a beautiful Brooklyn view Heights. of Manhattan. What was it? Uh, 10 Montague Terrace. Yeah, which is a real address that looks yep. exactly like where they say it is. 
And apparently they filmed the exterior and the interiors there. In this? Okay. And uh, the um, Christina Raines, the lead actress, said that, like, a lot of, like, spoopy, spooky noises were heard. Like, mm. even, like, around filming, like, the apartment she stayed in, coincidentally, also was rented by a priest Whoa. as well. So, like, that weird kind of art imitating life, imitating art, imitating bad art, imitating <laughs> good art. Yes. This is bad art imitating good art or good art or, imitating I bad think this art. this is good art imitating, imitating bad I think art. you are right. I think you're right because I enjoy the shit out of this movie. Um, but who, okay, now we get yeah. one of the best characters. This is, so if in our, in our, you know, dime store version of Rosemary's Baby, instead of, you know, the, the next door neighbors, you know, we get Miss Logan and Miss yes. Logan is the, the real state. Real realtor. She's the I realtor. Guess. Yeah, the realtor. Yeah. But she is Satan's realtor. Yes, that's 100%. like and, and and listen. If you don't get that she is Satan's realtor, then I don't think you need to be listening to this podcast anymore. <laughs> well, she has you know she has a voice that is a hundred Marlboros deep, and yes. she is, and she's so good. She's uh, I it's love it. So Dallas Dynasty, like the wide yes. brimmed hats, yes. the the like. Ever, like she is so Upper East Side, you know, just darling, 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 darling. I love her conversations with Allison and and uh, talking about her being a model and living alone and maybe has her boyfriend come over from time to time. And the realtor says, "I find New Yorkers have no sense for anything other than sex and money." Yes. Like, okay. All right, Selma or Patty, whichever. Oh one my you God! Are. Right. Yeah. Um, where she she's she's looking over, you know, she she's legit standing directly over Allison's shoulder as she's filling out the thing. She's like, oh, Mott, like as she's filling it out. She's like, to quote, from Baltimore. Hmm. How nice. <laughs> I was like, oh, you fucking cunt. You rich cunt. This is amazing. That is that is the definition of shade. Hmm. Yes. Baltimore. How nice. I cackled. Oh, Satan's realtor. So this is where, like, I just became obsessed with the uh, financial conversions in this movie. So this oh, apartment. Dear. Oh, you went down that rabbit hole. I was, I was like, this... I was like, it's all. It's like the friend's apartment. It's it just is. Be it's well, funny I just money. Was, I was just thinking about about what about, but the variable prices, right? Like, it's not. It's the. So we saw a, like a Central Park. Sure. Maybe not Central Park West, but Upper West Side, Upper East Side apartment, kind of your classic modern refurbished New York apartment for a thousand a month, which is about five thousand now. And then here we're looking at in Brooklyn Heights, which is closer to Midtown than oh, the yeah. Upper East Side. Basically, yeah. Brooklyn Heights is gorgeous. And you have a view of the, the bay, the upper the bay and, yeah. and the skyline. And you, uh, it is going to be four hundred dollars a month, which is nineteen hundred, just a That's shade under two thousand a month. And it's crazy to me, like how different Brooklyn to Manhattan prices were in the nineteen seventies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because nobody went to Brooklyn back then. Like, well, it, they it, went to that part, that that part of Brooklyn. A little actually, bit, yeah. That holds a very specific place, uh, especially in the gay community, because that was where your rich you know, like sort of waspy gays mm -hmm. would go like your Truman Capotes mm -hmm. or a lot of your stage directors and designers that worked in the theater, but were homosexual would lived in that area. Like Hart Crane wrote like under the Brooklyn bridge be for the Brooklyn promenade um, because they were not main, they were not Manhattan society, but they were adjacent to Manhattan yeah. society. Well, and also famously Walt Whitman lived there too. Walt yeah. Whitman lived in, in uh uh, speaking of like high <laughs> A plus gays in, yeah, uh, in right. Brooklyn Heights, yeah. Okay, so uh, what I love about this, this, you know, like okay, so we're now, now getting this is the third time we're gonna watch a New York City real, you know, like real. How much is the place? Oh, look at the windows. Oh, uh -huh. yes, the view. I I forgot to tell you about the view, which you know you and I both know that this view is sick, right? Like so oh, good. Oh, I just forgot to tell you. Oh <laughs> yes, I've seen it a million times. But what's interesting is that Miss Logan says 500 and Allison's like 500. And she's like, no, no, I said 400. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, four, four, 400, 400 a month. Like, it's such a, like, she's not negotiating. She, she's like giving it away. Right. Yeah. Again, red flag should be like 
red flag number four. Just, yeah. Is if something's like, too good to be true, it often is. It often is. So, um, but she also says there's a bunch of crazy neighbors, but everybody's fine. You'll meet them eventually. That and no, she says that, she, doesn't she? I oh, I don't remember her saying that. The oh, you might be right. Or is it one of those down. things that's assumed? I didn't go back and watch because I think it's spoiler, assumed. She's gonna say like she's. I thought like she she, she swaps she swaps her mind, and yeah. I was like, wait, is she trying to make Allison think she's crazy? By being like, I've never talked about neighbors before in my life. No, I don't she think she does. It? I think it's Charles who we'll meet in a minute. Okay. I think it's Burgess Meredith who talks okay. about all the neighbors. The only thing we know is uh, this beautiful apartment. It's fully furnished. It's got 10-foot oh, pocket right. doors oh, and 12-foot ceilings, whatever. And $400 a month, this this it, fucking banger view of Lower it's Manhattan. It's like wood oak paneling from oh, here to the like God, floor to ceiling. Dying. It's, it's a gated apartment building. It's got a little <laughs> garden. Fuck this place. Although so, I will say the the art in the the stairwell is depressing as fuck oh I yeah like, i was like those stairwells look bleak <laughs> well but then again it is the gateway to hell it's a hell mouth so what do you want totally yeah yeah it's, this is much nicer than that uh weird louisiana motel that we saw in uh... oh my god can you imagine i wish <laughs> that beyond. like oh i do wish that like somebody would make a movie about all the hell mouth movies you There's got to be – maybe that's something to add to our list at some point in time as a style or a uh, a scare is some – a hell mouth needs to be there somewhere. Have we found them all? There's got to be more. There's Yeah, I, I got to think there's a lot. Okay, so the one thing we do learn that I know for sure we do learn from Miss Logan when we're leaving, they see somebody up on the fifth floor of this apartment yes. building staring down from the window. And we learn that's Father Halloran. He's blind. He's always up there. Yes. Like, you just pay him no mind. It's fine. He's not even staring at you. He's just blind. This is just what this idiot does is just hang out the window all day. And as soon as she said that, I immediately thought of that news report that you find so funny of the woman saying, and now we cut to a story about a man who climbed Mount Everest, except he's gay. He's gay. He's blind. He's <laughs> blind. <laughs> and so but in my mind, gay. <laughs> Ava Gardner is saying... Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. It's your only neighbor. He's a priest. He's gay. He's gay. He's blind. He's a blind <laughs> priest. Not a gay. He's not. A... But everything in this movie is kind of fucking gay. So she wasn't wrong. Yep. Shout out to newscaster Cynthia Izaguera for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I do. <laughs> okay. Like, we'll just brief mention of this photo shoot that she's at, which involves her standing around a pool. People have yes. big fluffy dogs. Uh, there's a peacock and there's a horse like losing its fucking mind, knocking well, all the animals. Yeah, well, all, all the animals sudden, are going she, ape shit. Listen, you touch a hellmouth and uh, the animals know it, right? Yep. Sign sign number one. This is also the first moment she has like we see the full pass out. Yeah, from her. Okay, now let's talk about Burgess Meredith as Charles from Four B. Jeffrey, I think Burgess Meredith might be like one of my top five favorite actors. He's so good. Like top 10, top 10. But like, he, yeah, like every time I see him, he is so like, it is like, they literally don't make them. They don't make people like that anymore. Or if they do, they're not actors. Yeah. And they're certainly not famous Hollywood actors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're um, probably like there probably are people like Burgess Meredith running around, but they're probably like owners of CEOs of tech startups or something. I don't fucking know. Yeah. But, but there's just something that is so welcoming and terrifying about him. He's in that category of of just he's in the Hall of Fame of character actors, right? And I think yeah. about like uh M Emmett Walsh, yeah. uh, who always could play like evil mean sheriff or like bumbling crook or drunk yeah. best friend and Burgess Meredith can play yep. like Disney narrator he uh -huh. can play uh n tough in New York cabbie with a heart of uh, gold yeah 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 um but he uh what's, what's the name of Columbo um um oh, Peter Falk Peter Falk he's like Peter Falk is another one of those uh -huh. but but there's something there's a mischievousness about him that I love um and in this role <laughs> We're not getting rock. Hey, rock. You know, yeah, drink these yeah. we're not getting that. We're not getting the penguin. We are getting 
a uh, older, uh, slightly effeminate, but not Mm -hmm. explicitly effeminate man who has two furry baby feathery babies. Yeah, he's got he a little fur baby and has a feather baby. A little yellow parakeet and a little black and white cat named Jezebel. Jezebel, happy birthday to <laughs> you. Black and white cat. Black and white cake. Black and white cat. Dude, we, okay, we need to get on some fucking merch for this show and we need to make a black and white cat, black and white cake. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I think having uh having uh Jezebel's face with that fucking Fuck. a little sideways a little party hat. Party hat. <laughs> okay. So, so Burgess Smith, like he is Oh, he's also, he does, but like, he's doing magic tricks in the hallways. This yeah. dude is on fire. Yeah. Like, he is the uncle that you fucking wish you had. Yeah. Except he's also probably a demon, but is in fact Satan himself, we're going to learn. Yeah. I think, I, as I read. So, I, yeah. Satan. Satan or Satan's general or whatever, but yeah. I think it's actual Satan. Like, okay. Like, Lucifer himself is a lot of fun at parties. Yeah. And and he well, okay so in this initial introduction what is she just sort of runs by her and, and he seems a lot but that's yeah, it. he he comes into her apartment and kind of like you know he makes himself at home he leaves a little photo of himself in her apartment oh my God I know like as a calling card like in a silver frame like yeah. who fucking does that shit anymore Can you imagine you no. go to someone's house for the first time like here something to remember me by and it's him with like a dozen roses and i was like well there's his grinder profile <laughs> i also love that he's like look at you know, listen when you live in new york city as much as you may love or hate your neighbors you always want to see the inside of the apartments yes now listen i this is an instance where i didn't have terrible like hell neighbors but i had like awesome neighbors i lived in a building in spanish harlem that was a converted victorian schoolhouse so each floor was like two floors and they were converted into lofts so like our apartment had like four it was like tall as a motherfucker and our landlady was a woman who dealt lived on the penthouse had the entire top floor of a square block uh-huh. This apartment is like 104th and, you know, whatever. She was a Chinese importer-exporter. And the elevator went all the way to the top. And only once or twice did I get to see into this apartment. And when I say this apartment rivaled the the wing in Eastern art at the Met, uh-huh. I am not joking. Wow. Like, like. 12 foot tall vases as you enter and that was and she was cool as shit she was cool laid back she was like yeah i got you know oh you need to drop you need like a week on your rent cool no problem whatever wow but like this is the thing and i love lucifer slash burgess meredith slash charles chasen he's like oh like just kind of turning everything over and just being like i like the way oh i like how this is done this is real. Mm-hmm. this is exactly how i would have <laughs> done it which is ironic because you know Miss Ava Gardner is his realtor. Yes. <laughs> and that's how she did it. Well, and also, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm seconding what you were saying about, like, that's so New York, the the notion that you want. I didn't even think about that until you just said it, but it's totally true. You always you, you want to see, you see into inside the other your neighbor's apartments. Because all, they're, you know, like, like a, a two-bedroom, one-bath railroad apartment is going to be the same universal. But you're like, oh, well, oh, you put a plant over there. Oh, that's small. Oh, 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 this kitchen. I don't have that open air in my <laughs> no, kitchen. I... Mine's closed in. Like, oh, I, oh, interesting. I oh, oh, yeah. oh, you have a gas stove? I didn't what? know we got gas here. <laughs> yeah, that sort of stuff. But I love this. I it just the, It's just charming as fuck. Every moment with Burgess Meredith is charming as fuck in this film. There's another component that they just again we we joke about Chekhov's blank in this show yep. all the time like here's Chekhov's knife here's Chekhov's you know uh, Sherman tank whatever but the we have Chekhov's passing out which never comes yep. into play the yep. other thing we have is Ch- Chekhov's non-working telephone oh my god and I it's know, only right? mentioned early it on but I'm like okay anywhere. when you tell me in a horror movie yeah. in the first third of this movie. I the phone company still hasn't installed my phone, and Charles says, "Well, I don't have a phone either. Like, what? Yeah, I yeah. don't even oh, yeah. talk to anyone." And he realized, "Oh shit, there's gonna come a moment. You're gonna kind of wish we had that phone. Never comes up again. No, surely not. <laughs> okay, 
So, it's also quite lovely to watch the 1970s in which an evening in was, you know, you put on like a record of classical music and make like pour yourself a scotch. And mm -hmm. that was all there was to do. Because there's no phones, there's no yeah. nothing. It's like, oh my God, beam me back. Yeah. Well, and phone calls like would start costing money after oh a certain God, amount of time. Right? And yeah. yeah. It's like, I have to call Albany. That'll be a $30 call. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we also meet Gerda and Sandra on the first floor. This is, yep. So, so Gerda. Alice, Allison's out doing shopping. And she's, uh -huh. got her, she's like, she's like, you know what? I'm living the dream. My hair is lustrous. My hair <laughs> is easy to manage. Mm -hmm. That is the tagline. That is her it claim to fame. Yep. And she meets the downstairs neighbors. Jeffrey, do you want to take this one? Sure. Okay. So Gerda is, she is 40s, 50s, uh, very I'd say, I'd say, yeah. 50s, er earthy German wearing yes. a uh, a leotard. Uh huh. Um, with some like uh, with a little tool pants. around, yeah, yeah. yeah, and some tool. Very like, Suspiria, very OG Suspiria, not the new Suspiria. Yep. And Sandra, who is who doesn't speak at all in Does this movie, not. I don't think, no. um, is debut of Beverly D'Angelo from the Vacation. Beverly, films. motherfucking D'Angelo. Good morning, Starshine. <laughs> and she is fully blonde hair, very you know, like got her uh, eyes are just like. like in f like a full red, uh, what do you call this? This is uh, uh, like a coverall, like a red. A um, a le she's in a full leotard, and um, but with like no, no, the leotard, leotard. That's a unit, and then with like, red tights underneath. Yeah, she yeah, is, yeah. She's she, scarlet. Um, yeah, she's a scarlet. You're right. It's not red. It's scarlet and matching yes. nails and flowing feathery blonde hair like the wings of an eagle, and it's uh, it's amazing. She doesn't talk much. Gerda is uh has some great lines she asks alice she, she invites allison and in, let me make you some coffee great. oh do you we'll prefer talk. tea oh you like coffee that is good and gerda like, says oh, is it oh, okay was that your boyfriend she said yes and he goes yeah. he seems an adequate lover oh my god yes. sandra used to date a man <laughs> he was no good <laughs> oh my god i'm gonna i'm just gonna like my new grinder profile is gonna be adequate lover <laughs> Not shooting for not shooting for great here. Just, just going for adequate. So, at one point in time, Gerda also gets up uh, to excuse herself, and that is when Sandra just starts masturbating through her clothes. Yep. Yep. Just staring right just at Allison the whole time, just fully staring her in the eye, and just going to town, just flicking that bean. She she is, and she. This is not a like you just slowly slide your hand down no. and you're being like, oh, she's touching herself. She's jerking it. Like she yeah. is like <laughs> slapping it sideways. And it is, uh, it this is, is like, hard. yeah, you want some cream in your coffee? Uh? Uh, this is like, if she were nude, this yeah. would be hardcore pornography. This yeah. would be a triple it's X film. Raw. Like it is it's super so raw. raw. And what's, and okay. Now listen again, talking about like types of actors, you know, like there's certain types, things go in and out of vote. Like, she like Beverly Angela has the face of like, like she's like the bratty younger sister, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But like gorgeous, but also like trouble, you know, like yep. you just know she, she's trouble, but in the best possible way. And she has no lines. Did some digging. Apparently the director and the producers kind of, it was all like a clusterfuck and everybody didn't trust anybody and everybody hated everybody. But the director actually wanted Christopher Walken in the Chris Sarandon role. Christopher Walken as the lawyer boyfriend. Uh-huh. Because Chris Sarandon was too uh, he was too one, they said he was too Greek, too ethnic. Um oh, and also he was like Lord. he was a classical Shakespeare guy, so he was a little too uh, like not masculine enough. And the director hated Christina Reigns and wanted Beverly D'Angelo in the main role. So Beverly D'Angelo gets so much fucking screen time because the director had a hard on for her. Amazing. And uh, you know what? God bless it. Well, honestly, yeah. I mean, like if you're thinking I would rather, <laughs> I'd rather Beverly D'Angelo and Christopher Walken than these other two people that I, somebody born right about this time the movie is being made. So yeah. I'm not even aware of it until a year or two ago, this film. 
like if he wants a couple of actors that Beverly D'Angelo and Christopher Walken over two people I've never heard of. Yeah, that's that's good foresight. OK, so I want to get to my favorite. I think maybe piece of dialogue total, you know, just exchange when Gerda returns. Allison is trying to pretend she didn't just see Sander do what she did. Mm-hmm. She is being the most like, I'm just pretending I didn't see this. And she asked Gerda, she says, what do you do for a living? And Gerda says, we fondle each other. And she puts her hand right on her thigh, on Sandra's thigh. Classic. Uh, uh, again, like this, it's just, yeah, that's that's it. That's yeah. the, That is the height of art, Jeffrey. Oh, it's so good. Okay, we're having more and more fainting spells at these commercial shoots. These commercial shoots are just weird interstitials. Like, they don't actually yeah. move the plot other than to say she's having fainting spells. And here's a comical scene. Like, previously, it was the animals going crazy. Right. In this scene, it's Allison not placing the wine bottle on the table correctly over and over. With Jerry over. Orbach as the mean director. <laughs> That's right. And then she passes out into some glass. I'm like, how is your face oh, not right. cut open at this right? point? Okay, now Charles is having a party. Come oh upstairs. Oh my God. Me, and Allison. it's like, and she's, you know, she's like, I'm taking these pills. Oh yeah, because they, the, the doctor quote, just prescribed some random pills. And she's like, these pills are making me crazy. Bitch, you ain't seen crazy yet because yeah. here we go. <laughs> and Burgess Meredith is like, it'll just be, no, no, just a few minutes. This is where he's also like pulling scarves out of his, fucking thing and he's like i'm going to blindfold you Mm -hmm. don't peek and this film does something really interesting that uh, like only every once in a while you see this in which the screen goes black Uh uh-huh and you just and it and we're kind of we are in the position of the lead character the main character and that it's an all auditory experience and we don't know what the fuck we are going to walk in on well, I'll and tell you what we walked in on, which is a Samuel Beckett play. <laughs> Cat birthday party! <laughs> Happy birthday, Jezebel. Um, okay, so what's weird about this party is that there's a bunch of old people um, and just like odd charactered people. Again, so Dime Store, Rosemary's Baby, which is sort of, you know, nickel store version of, uh-huh. uh, you know, La Strada and like all that Fellini, you know, weird people on film. You know, weird, interesting, unique, like, like that thing of like finding the weirdest looking faces you can possibly find and then highlighting them. That was the 70s. And you get this. What's also crazy. Yes, this is a cat birthday party that is decorated exactly like her father's orgy. You're right. You got that right. Like the streamers are the same color. The cake is this or the, you know, like everything. It looks and it it's it's like um there's something about like the colors of it that is so like hard to watch mm-hmm. you know because this movie is already setting you up to be like sex and party you know like weird incest satan like you're you're just on you're in it you're yeah. you're taste the rainbow right yeah. now uh i love all it's just filled with people also gerda and and uh and sandra are there gerda says have a hat and noisemaker for the yes. party. <laughs> yes, welcome to the party. There's an old woman in um one of those giant palm chairs. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? And mm-hmm. again, very 70s that I will eventually have in my fern room, um, in my imagined 1970s fern room. Uh-huh. And she just says, black and white cat, black and white cake. And Allison just goes, who is she? And we get a name <laughs> for this old lady. Uh-huh. At which point, Burgess Meredith says, you know what it's time for? It's polka time. Yeah. And, we and do there's some, some dancing. Uh-huh. They do some dancing. And then they bring out the cake. I also love the sort of like weird Nazi undertone to like the whole thing. Like, yeah, because th- there's a lot of uh, very Teutonic looking people sitting at this table. They're all kind of wearing It's a bit like The Shining. They're wearing like tuxedos of yesteryear, gowns of yesteryear. I was going to say, I was getting subtle. I was getting Shining vibes. I was also getting, to speak to the Nazi thing, I was getting a stage version of Cabaret. Not the movie version, but stage version. Like the the way in which the Nazis, that song starts uh, 
like Adel, uh, uh, yeah yeah Edelweiss or, not Edelweiss yeah. but the the little Nazi youth him that it's only sung once in the movie yeah. but it, it's a repeated theme throughout the stage yes. production as it as it you the, know tomorrow belongs to th- me yeah tomorrow um, belongs to me I love it there's like what there's this another guy at the party who's just like it's like they're dancing around and he's clearly just kind of like oh ho hum he's mm-hmm. like all right time for cake he's like about time or just like it's so silly yeah and uh at one point there's two women who who are there and i this is this is some of my favorite screenwriting and um they're dancing around and they're having this like raucous joyous and there's shots of the cat and there's shots uh-huh. of the bird and shots uh-huh. of d- d- dancing and this woman just says i remember i remember and that's it it's two women one says it yeah. brings back memories and that's the other it. says i remember yeah and it, it's it's so stagey. I loved, I wrote that down. I loved yeah. that. I loved those lines. I thought that was so good. It like, was, what, it felt like a Beckett play. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm being dead serious. This feels like a Beckett play, uh, this whole scene. It's, oh, it's fantastic. And to top it off, there's a fucking tuxedo cat wearing a little, little wearing party, a fucking hat, party hat. Looking that, disappointed as shit. J- Jeffrey, we need to find out like, like on the, the 10, we need to go to 10 Montague Terrace and find out when this fucking cat's birthday is. And we should light a candle and give a little, little cat shaped, a cat shaped birthday cake for Satan's Lucifer's cat in Brooklyn. Yeah. And why uh, this is not a citywide holiday, I, I will eat my gay hat. I, yeah, I'm I'm on board with your notion of maybe this should be our first uh, non-logo t-shirt, which is uh, maybe David can get us a black and white cat, black and white cake that has yeah. the words black and white cat, black and white, black cake. And white cake from the Sentinel. And from we the... will be the nerds uh, yes. of the world. Okay. So later that she night, she wakes up the next day. Yeah. Well, she has In dreams that night, uh, late oh, at that's night. Right. No, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's having dreams of this party again, but in this party now is the overlay of an orgy. Like now yeah. it is everyone's naked and bouncing. This is where you kind of realize if Her you didn't catch- is there, always in the white suit. Mm-hmm. And uh, when she wakes up, the chandelier is shaking and she can hear somebody pacing oh, yes. in the apartment upstairs. And she's on the second floor, I believe. And I, the no- notion is there shouldn't be anyone on the third should floor. Should be anyone on the third floor because I think, yeah. oh, one of the one of the crazy Germans at the party said, oh, we used to live in that apartment, but we moved to you know, somewhere else. Uh, but we like to visit as often as we can. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. But that they said they couldn't lease the apartment because, because there of were the leaks. leaks. Yeah. And then Father O, Father O Creepy is up on the fourth floor. Yeah. The uh, fifth floor. Fifth floor. Yeah. Fifth floor. And Charles is the fourth. Oh, that's right. And then the lesbian couple is on the first floor. First. Okay, so now crazy shit's happening. And we've got Michael and Allison are both looking into what's happening in this apartment in very different ways. Michael is calling a man named Jim Brenner, who is a former detective slash PI, but real thuggy. This plot goes nowhere. Jeffrey, well, I don't it's even it does, but it doesn't. It it goes a little bit, but not anywhere interesting. Does it prove um, anything, or does it like anything? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about Brenner's death doesn't really get yeah. anywhere. It's more just that, like, we learn about Michael's connection to Brenner and the yeah. fact that there's it, it's revealed, although slowly and to nobody's surprise that he had used Brenner to kill his first wife. Yes. Although that actually, that subtlety was lost on me um, (laughs) because I was like, why are you just, why are you calling him and not picking up the phone? He's dead. Like if your private eye doesn't check in until five days later, do you remember possession? Yeah. Listen, do (laughs) do I have to remind you of possession with the the super cute gay Uh PI that's like my, boyfriend fucking died for this case i yeah. i'm out of here yeah but like if your pi doesn't check in after a few days you're in a horror movie and he's dead yeah so uh, but he does so wh- where this is important i guess to the, the the plot points is is that he calls brenner who right. he needs to go check up on this house and to check up on allison allison yeah. goes to see miss logan yes the realtor 
who basically, say, you know, she complains like, listen, this apartment's beautiful, but everyone else in that building is keeping me awake at it's night. And the realtor nuts. said, uh, my dear Miss Parker, aside from the priest and you, no one has lived in that building for, I don't know, three years. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. Oh, no. And they go oh, to the apartment no. and she shows her that all the other apartments are empty. No one yep. lives there. Yep. Okay. Now, we also see our man in black from the beginning. Yep. We've he has seen him a little in New York City, but he is now at, in Brooklyn Heights. Yep. Uh, following, is, following Allison around. Yep. And he's uh, he's gone to see father halloran on the fifth floor and he's like i am here holy father so that you may shed your holy burdens in peace whatever okay they try and go allison and the realtor and miss logan try to go up and see the priest just to yeah. just to be like maybe you'll feel better if you just talk to him but Listen, these two yeah. dudes man in black and priesty don't answer, they the, door don't answer at all. the door they just go quiet and like there's like two moments in this film in which allison specifically almost talks to the sentinel the priest that is standing watch yeah. up in that apartment and i was like just let just to, no i know that like for the for reasons of plot and tension the whole thing is built around them not meeting but like you got to make it less flimsy than just like knock 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 nobody's home you know <laughs> uh -huh. like if i was at the level of like you know like later when uh, when michael is back with the keys and she's there Bitch, I would be pounding on that door. I'm like, I don't care if you're blind. And Miss Logan's still like, oh, he's he's got the rickets or something like that. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah. Well, he can walk his rickety ass to the door because we need to talk about what's going on in this building right now. Mm -hmm. so, I know, but it's it's, it's just so yeah. ugh, you're so oh, so close. So it's later that night. Uh, we see Jim Brenner uh, out the PI outside of. Yep her apartment late at yep. night and Keeping he sees an the old he sees father halloran on the top floor and then allison wakes up at 3 30 a.m hearing those same footsteps chandelier is swinging she goes chandelier. out into the oh hallway God, I love and it. she sees jezebel the cat eaten chucky the parakeet whatever yeah. whatever the name of that bird was that charles had on his yes. shoulder and um that's super gross and disgusting she goes upstairs to charles's apartment and it is just empty like nobody, literally nobody is there. And then some figure walks right past her. This is the first like really spooky moment to it's me. It's so good because it's, it's, um you know, so the apartment is still decorated, but it's, uh -huh. you know, there's like, it's all blank. Like there's blank spaces on the walls and a white robed, pretty much naked gray figure has been standing there the whole time. It's one uh -huh. of those where like they were standing in the shadows and all he does is just walk from one corner of the screen to the other right in front of Allison. And she goes, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Pardon me. Like she doesn't, she sort of underreacts to this, I would say. I would be literally screaming and I'd be throwing furniture if I saw somebody in this apartment. But crazy, mm -hmm. it's her dad. Yeah. It's her dad. Dad. And the and and the women from the and the the naked ladies too yeah. show up briefly yep. in this scene. But yeah, and the dead dad is now attacking Allison and she's yeah. got a knife. And oh, that's she right. she cuts his nose right off. She cuts his nose off. She uh gouges his excuse me. She gouges his eye with the knife, and then she yep. finally like stabs him right in the heart. Yeah. He collapses. He he actually cuts a little bit like birthday cake, I would say. Yeah. yeah. His face is kind of like cake. Black and white cake. Black and white cake. Black and white, black cat, and white, black and white cake. <laughs> and she runs out into the street screaming, and we get this overhead shot of a neighbor's coming running out to I love this because I it's kind too. of it's like an inverse Halloween. Yeah. You know? Because listen, when you live in New York City, you get used to like day. Three, when I moved to New York City, I saw a woman taking a shit on the sidewalk. And mm -hmm. I was like, while talking on the phone, breaking up with her boyfriend. Like, it's <laughs> it's so insane like that. And it's kind of a constant barrage. So to see someone who is, you know, and she's very provocatively dressed in like a white little negligee sort of thing, mm -hmm. splotch of red. And she, and it's an overhead shot. And she runs into the street, screams and just falls to the ground. And you see people rush from every apartment. And I was like, one, 
that would not happen. Um, you would need probably more screaming than that. Uh -huh. But yeah. it is kind of a shocking moment of like, oh shit, like something really bad is happening when your neighbors come out of other buildings to be like, there's a woman like dying in the street kind of shit. For real, for real. So now, um, now we've got the police showing up to interrogate Michael. This is where we see young Chris Walken. Yes. Uh, uh, now into our giallo mode the, yes. like hard listen i love the 70s cops that talk real tough and you don't know if they're kidding or if they're not or everybody hey like it's all precinct attack on precinct one two three pelham taking a pelham <laughs> one two three or something like that you so know? we've got detective gats who's the older guy who has all the lines and chris walken who has like one line who plays rizzo but basically you know, this is where we learn like, hey, well, you know, seems like you you seems like you attract a lot of women who lose their fucking minds. Right. Like, um, hey, how about you go a little easy on the fact I that know, right? his girlfriend just had a breakdown in the street and his ex-wife died by suicide. So yeah. like, let's They're like, uh, am I know. under suspicion here? <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing is like th this film, I will say in the I love Chris Randon um, one. And he plays like he he plays a cool cucumber. Like yeah. you you probably know him as um oh uh, uh from the Princess Bride. He's um my name is Father it, Father Antoya. Not not that guy, but no, it's the one who tries to kidnap Princess Buttercup. Humperdinck. Oh, he's Prince okay. Humperdinck. Oh, oh, that's right, that's right. He's Prince Humperdinck. Yeah, right. I believe. And you're he's right. also in Fright Night. He is he is uh so like he's of of a side, but he's so. You don't know if he did murder his wife. Like he might be making his girl, current girlfriend Allison, crazy. Like this mm -hmm. might be that plot. Mm -hmm. It's not, but the way he plays it is very smart and very like cool as a cucumber. And so, like when we get into the giallo, like is he a murderer or is it Satanist? You know, like yeah. that kind of thing. You really don't know. No. Well, and the and so we have these we have Gats and Rizzo, these two cops who very much are suspicious of Michael and yeah. confused by what Allison yeah. is going through because she had blood on her, but there was no body. Yeah. She claimed yeah. to have killed her own dad who had died a died months earlier. earlier. Yeah, yeah, or however long earlier. And the blood that was on her matched her same blood type. Right. So but so but she has no cuts on her. And so they're just yep. like, I don't know what's happening. Uh, so they're, they're a little confused by this. So that you can tell these two cops are very much like, I think there's something fucked up with Michael as a person. Yeah. 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 We're going to point the suspicion on the boyfriend, but they don't have really any evidence. And it's funny because they go to their boss, whoever the sar sergeant boss captain, I don't know. Right, right. Yeah. But their boss is like, uh, you can fuck off with uh, like, just, you don't have shit. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, you found somebody with a similar blood type? That's like a third of all New Yorkers have yeah, that yeah, blood yeah, type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> good job. I just think it's funny that they, at no times, do the cops trace the church element. You know? Like, they never go, oh, she was... <laughs> the only other person in this building is a priest. And a priest that has been grandfathered into this building uh -huh. since the early 1930s. Maybe we should go talk to the priest. Maybe. <laughs> just just spitballing here. Just I've never been a cop before, but mm -hmm. and I've never played one on TV. I'm just just saying, you know, doing mm -hmm. an improv exercise. If I was, you know, just one more thing. Um, <laughs> let's go talk yeah. to the only other living witness that we got in the building. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Have a good day. So um they uh they also the cops then couple other things one is Al, uh, sorry Allison had mentioned the names of some of the people she met at yes. the party she was at yes. the night before and uh, one of the people was a woman named this older woman named Anna Clark and they find a photo of her and they show it to her and she's like yes that's her and they're like yeah this mm -hmm. is Anna Clark uh she was executed several years ago she was a uh, serial killer here in new york state and was yep. sent to sing sing and killed murdered. her killed, killed her husband and her lover to which yeah. i said he had it coming <laughs> he had it coming he had it coming all along like really it's the cast of chicago you yes. understand so this so this party she went to for this imaginary party for hosted by lucifer himself is really a mashup of cabaret 
and Chicago. And if that isn't gay heaven, then I don't know what is. Yeah. Okay. So they, um, so that's a thing that's happened. And then also the cops. They're all dead. They, they're all famous murderers. Uh, yeah. All of these people were, they're not alive. They are dead murderers. They're dead, whatever. And the cops also get a call. Uh, Gats and Rizzo get a call and they, there's a dead body that was found nowhere close to Brooklyn Heights is know, the body of scene. Jim Brenner, PI, yeah. but he's got the same blood type as the girl. Yes. It's the Goyle. And they, that's the Goyle. And they know that, they know that he is connected to Michael in some way, but they can't prove it. Yes. You know, they can't prove that there's a connection, which I thought was kind of funny. They're like, we found this body, like probably in New Jersey or something. Uh And I was like, this is connected to this case. I'm like, is it connected to this case, Jeffrey? This is one of those where I was like, we have a character that we just don't know what to do with. This this investigation stuff almost, it really goes nowhere because even when it makes sense, it's just sort of toothless. Like there's no, these cop characters are pretty flat. Chris Walken is the most interesting of all of the cops because he is so mean (laughs) without saying anything. Yeah. It's the way he looks at a room. It's the way he sizes up a room and other people. He looks like a fucking shark. Yeah. He's great in this movie. Like, Um, like I love it. Like everybody in this movie is that the, the, the people that are going to be famous, you know, that are going to be the, the, you know, like Uh they're so young and hungry in this movie. You know, you know, like, like they showed up to work every day of this film. Yeah. And learning about the production history apparently was kind of a nightmare shoot. But they were like, fucking Jeff Goldblum, Beverly D'Angelo, like even Allison Parker, like all, you know, or Christina Raines, the shit she went through. She said she never saw this film because it like was so into the filming was so terrible for her from the director's like standpoint. She never went back to watch it. Yeah. But. They're fucking young and hungry, which is yeah. which is kind of fun to watch. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it is very, very fun to watch. Um, I, it did strike me that Christopher Walken at age 22 or whatever he is here yeah. sounds exactly the same as he sounds oh, yeah. at current age 72. Um, and then also Jeff Goldblum, by contrast, sounds nothing. He looks like he does, but he no, doesn't, no, no. He no, doesn't no. sound like he sounds like he, your you know, instincts. Jeff Goldblum, your instincts are correct. Jeff Goldblum's lines were um, were put in later. They were dubbed in, or he they were record- dubbed in. He didn't oh. do it at all. Or I don't know if he did it or if somebody. But all of his lines, they like according to IMDb, all of his lines except for one are dubbed. So even though it looks it's Jeff Goldblum, it doesn't sound like Jeff Goldblum. Oh, that makes so much You're sense not crazy. because Jeff Goldblum in every movie I've seen has a Jeff Goldblum has that Jeff Goldblum way yeah, nope. Christopher Walken has his cadence. Yep. Okay. Thank you for telling me that because I was feeling I was being gaslit by this film, Cecil. No, I, I could have. Oh, I could have gaslit you. Be like, <laughs> no, no, that's what Jeff Goldblum sounds like, Jeffrey. All right, let's get into this church shit. So okay, she There's goes a cabal within a cabal. I guess. Yeah, she goes or to this is church. There. <laughs> is there? I don't even know. She How, goes. What? Um, she goes to confession. Yeah, and she confesses to man in black right at this local Catholic church at whatever listen, at Grand Army just, Plaza. She she's she's just looking for any help. Yeah, and, and he's a priest she tells walks him up to her. <laughs> yeah, priest walks up. She starts confessing. She's like, I don't go to church anymore. Blah blah blah. I tried to kill myself a couple times as a kid. And listen, the other night I had a dream and I saw my father and I stabbed him and he's already dead. And he's like, listen, believe in, embrace Christ and the Lord will protect yeah. you. I'm like, you're no help, dude. White as snow, et cetera, et cetera. Blah, blah, blah. But blah. then she just runs away. Yeah. Th- th- this is where I was like, okay, this character is so woefully underused in this fucking movie. Like, okay, this movie does have a bit of like a Buffy kind of like what like not just the hell mouth but the idea is that there is a guardian of humanity uh-huh. facing the hordes that are tend to crop up around hell mouth and essentially allison is a buffy like character yeah in that she is the she's the hope for all of humanity right yeah this priest gives her nothing you are a terrible giles is what well, i'm saying that's in, so no? i intro this this episode talking about my feeling about these uh possession movies and this isn't a possession sure. movie but like demon Catholic-y, hellmouth catholic yeah. movies catholic is, magic-y stuff is what it does is it places a heroism in the catholic church and in jesus christ and faith in christ 
and it sort of externalizes the villainy. So mm -hmm. I was really interested in this being a movie about a cabal within a cabal, but it's not. Like it's the Catholic Church is inherently good in this movie. Yeah. Believing in Christ is good. What it is is silly unquestionably good and it is satan trying to get into this world and it is our duty to believe in christ and to and it is this movie is like towards the end it gets borderline super christian which makes sense why it has such a camp following yeah yeah, yeah. because it is so stupid it so believes in itself yeah like giant institutions tend to they're like no just no jesus will wash you clean as snow why does yeah. snow and she's like ah as opposed to like, I don't know, actually like being like, what have you been experiencing? Like, I, oh, you know what? That's probably just Satan. Uh, okay, let me break this to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> let me break it to you gentle like, as opposed to in the moment we're going to show up with a giant gold cross and everyone's going to be impressed. Yeah. Like, what if we took the humanitarian approach? <laughs> it's like, okay, listen. <laughs> Into to be fair to this film, to be fair to this film, I have gone to, I have gone to non-Catholic clergy with problems and had them say you just need to pray more so oh, or yeah. some variation of that yeah, I know, so right? this movie does feel a little bit accurate in that way but when she I goes love... back to the church Wait, is that what you're about to say i'm sorry no 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 i was gonna say i love michael's investigation into mm -hmm. the church but um and, and which is so much more uh like um like a realist like he's like he breaks in you're like yeah. oh no first he goes to the church and he says you know, I'm a lawyer investigating a very vague um, case. And mo are... uh, money was left to Father yeah. Halloran. It's a oh, will yes. in dispute. Yeah. And, you know, and and Iron Ring Priest is like, yes, I am a church official that knows nothing <laughs> about a hellmouth. But I am interested in this law case you have presented me. Here is the dossier. Don't look in that cabinet, the one with the giant gold cross on it. No, no, no. You cannot uh -huh. take any documents outside of the church. This is all church property. Yeah. Namaste. Goodbye. Namaste. <laughs> he also, at one point, uh, Michael is with Allison in the apartment that she claimed to have, like, stabbed her father. And in the bookshelf has all these old, dusty books on it. Oh, this, this shit. This is pretty cool, I gotta admit. And so one of the ones that he's like these are just like standard old old books and she's like no this one every page is just the same it's just all in latin it's just the same latin phrase repeated over and over and he says this is a just an old novel in english uh-huh and finally he says will you just read this hun yep. and write down what you see and she yeah. does and we can see the words on the page are just like english words from an old novel and yeah. she is writing all in latin yeah do you and, want another little tidbit from yeah. the internet Okay, so she writes down like Tibi sortu chorus tuum vigili k severa munis, and everybody's like, oh, like later he'll get. He's like, oh, it's from mm -hmm. Paradise Lost. It's the the thing that the priests were chanting. Apparently, that actually translates to watching your office and running. <laughs> is what that Latin means. That that's far more interesting. <laughs> um. But I he love goes, this. Yeah. I kind of love this. And I think this is something from the book, which by all accounts, like everybody was like the author of the book was just like livid that this movie turned out the way it did. Yeah. Which I think I would be too, probably. Because he co-wrote the screenplay. He wrote the yeah. original draft. Yeah. But this idea of like of things that we take for granted, like green is green, blue is blue, up is, up, is up, down is down. English is English, French is French, Latin is Latin. But like what I love about that sort of mind fuck slow burn 70s horror film is that like those moments, this is the Scrabble moment in Rosemary's Baby, you know, mm -hmm. moments where you realize you have been looking at the universe a little wrong for you, like green is orange. Yeah. And that's where, like, you, you're you like, oh, fuck, I'm in a fucking horror movie now. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I love this. Like, did that weird moment of ambiguity between, like, Michael is like, wait, no, just write it. Like, like uh, what? Huh? You don't know how to read? What is going on? Like, well, I he, love that shit. Yeah. I, I wasn't as enamored with it as you were because I was, it just felt belabored, right? Oh, like, it takes forever to get there. <laughs> and there's a lot of belaboring in this movie. And I, I, it was fine. Like, I think it was the best approach, but he takes it to this professor who just kind of, we saw earlier, but just kind of feels like he comes out of nowhere. 
And yeah. he's like, hey, can you translate this for me? And he says, yeah, it says, to this happy place, no evil approach or enter within. And Michael goes, what does it mean? And I'm like, Michael, it means exactly what it says it means <laughs> to like, this happy place. I hope no evil comes in. <laughs> you're like, I hope that, you know, this is good. Like, don't, no evil, please. Yeah, yeah. It says no, no shirts, evil, no shoes, please. no service, you know? Yeah. It says it's wine o'clock. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and it's taking you to pound town. <laughs> it says uh, the professor tells him, well, it's from Paradise Lost by Milton. Also, Allison goes back to the church for another confession yes. with the man in black priest. And it is a different priest. And the priest is like, I've never seen you here. And she goes, why? Well, you saw another priest. And he's like, there is no other priest. Oh, no. Oh, no. And again, she just screams and runs out the door. Yeah. And the priest does nothing to talk to her. I was like, Ugh. what? Okay. This is suspicious. Yeah. Clearly suspicious activity. So Michael now goes to see this man named Perry in the middle of the night. He wait, this um, is another character, like one of those characters. Uh, uh um I can't oh, I can't find his name, but he's the same actor who's got he's got that voice, and he's in the black cat. Um uh, oh you, you know the the um the the oh this is William Hickey, William and Hickey. he was Thank from you. uh in the John Houston film Pritzy's Honor, Pritzy, yep. Prizzy, Pritz, Pritzy, Pritzy's, Pritzy's Honor, Pritzy's Honor. Uh, he was also in a Christmas Vacation. Yeah, uh, but he was uh, nominated for an Academy Award for Pritzy's Honor. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, another character actor but, like, type, but character beyond character beyond character actor. They're gonna break into like the Brooklyn Diocese at Grand Army Plaza and yeah. steal those records, is what they're going to do. And they're gonna go get Halloran's files. So now here's where we learn what all of this is about. That Michael is piecing all of this together, and Michael is like, "Oh, okay. So what happened is there were a series of people who committed who, who attempted suicide." Uh huh. And then later became later clergy uh -huh. on the date of their, when the predecessor died, their names changed and they became that clergy member. On that day. On that day. And Allison is listed as the latest and there's Allison is like shown her photo oh, comes I... up as like, she's going to be the next in line to replace that. a clergy member and How become known as that? sister Teresa. How do that okay, i don't one, know it's like and it's also like he finds it like tucked back into the back like oh wait there's one more file here oh my god it's my girlfriend but it's like they've got her picture and it's like a nice glossy eight by ten and, and it's like born tried to commit suicide but you know father or something you know like they've been following her since birth or she's been chosen since birth and the catholic church has just been like sitting back being like she is the next sentinel and That's so dumb, Jeffrey. It's that so, is it's so, so dumb. stupid and convoluted. And then also, I rewound this oh. line because I was so confused and I still don't understand. But he essentially he's telling all this to Perry, who's like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Like, you you pay me to pick locks. Literally, he says, I just I just open doors. <laughs> I and I was like, that's the best line. He's like, yeah. He's like, what do I do with this? He's like, I just uh I just open doors. So and Michael I says, if these files are right. Father Halloran dies the same day Allison Parker becomes Sister Teresa. And then he goes, tomorrow. Literally turns to the camera I, and goes, how, how do you and know? And that's tomorrow. How, how do you know? We got to talk about this. This is insane. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is one of the most confusing things that's, that's ever happened. I, 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 I have a lot of superlatives, but again. This is the disconnect. You and I are living in a world and a society in which we do not trust <laughs> at a pretty fundamental, but at a, you know, at a, a pretty fundamental level, the Catholic Church. I'm just gonna uh, say, but like the th not just the Catholic Church, but like larger institutions such as churches, the, the, the military, things like that. We have we have been brought up to question these things because our parents either supported cabals within cabals within cabals uh, yeah and are like may the god you know the blood of the lamb all that that's what we believe or you went total hellfire fuck you know like anarchist god is dead you know right. like that was the thing but i think 
making mass media in the 70s, they just would have been like, well, he's a priest, so of course we trust him. You know, like a, yeah. like in the same way that you believe a nice firm handshake and your word is your bond, a yeah. priest is always going to be good in a movie and yeah. in stories because priests are good. Of course. And so what's weird about this is that it's campy because it's so good, it's bad, uh-huh. and it's so bad, it's good. Yeah. It is it is heavily on that wheel of fortune. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Just spinning round and round. And so um, we watch this and we and we just like, oh my God, like the fucking evil lesbians that live downstairs mm-hmm. that have no reason for existing other than be like to masturbate in front of, you know, young, impressionable, heterosexual, cisgender women. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh my God. But it's all it's such a collection of claptrap devices. Yeah. put together and we're like no we believe it, it's a car with faith yeah. <laughs> you know we believe it's a horror movie because of faith and you and i are like do, I... do we well do and we also <laughs> to get into the catholic stuff or just the christian stuff in this the the evil forces are a lesbian couple yeah a, 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 a charles who's sort of like vaguely coded as gay at, at, yeah. at, at you know like just eccentric old man, eccentric like, confirmed bachelor. Yes, yeah. that sort of thing. And um, these um other and people, then and then a bunch of very like Teutonic, you know, Nazi ish, not old people. fashioned Nazi people, old and, fashioned not Huguenots or no, that's French. And, yeah, and so the the thing that we have is those are some of the vile qualities of them. Yeah, it's equated to killers. And yep. it's equated to suicide attempts. Yeah. So and and obviously that is a, a cardinal a big, sin. Is that the one? No, no. In the Catholic that's Church, that's the that's the that's the top line of sin in the Catholic Church, right? Yeah. That it's suicide. And so it's it's just driving these points home. And then you add to it, you have this unmarried couple in Michael yeah, and right. Allison. And one of the key problems in this movie is their lack of communication because she doesn't want to get married yet. But if they were communicating. This movie, I think, is very subtly hinting if she had just gotten fucking married to this guy, yeah. they could have worked together. But she she never would have needed the apartment in the first yeah. place. But she's too busy being feminist to like she's actually been like the it girl. She's got to have her own career. Yeah. And if she just the, look at all the work this man is putting into it and she's just running around passing out all the time. So there, there is a little bit of that in this movie, which, again, gets back to this so bad. It's good. It's good. It's bad. Whatever. OK, keeping going. There's another funny scene in here where so michael the night before had asked jennifer to stay the night with allison yes. like take care of her the next and she says but i'm throwing a party that well night. not yet no 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 oh, it's no. not okay. yet so the, no, no, okay. the next day it's no the no next no day. let me I'm, i I have this written down let me start oh, this over shit. okay <clears throat> the night that he goes to break into the Br- brooklyn diocese he leaves allison alone with Jennifer and he tells Jennifer, "Hey, take care of her. Spend the night. Please take. I got to go do a thing late. I got a client. I got to meet." And that's sure. when he breaks into the church, and so Jennifer does. Well, he doesn't get back until like seven in the morning, and he comes in at the sun is already up, and yeah. Jennifer is awake and she's like, "Oh, whose house did you sleep at last night?" Like a very good best friend <sighs> yeah, question yeah. to ask. She's yeah, like, yeah. "Oh, oh, uh, what was her name?" You know, does something like that. Mm-hmm. And he said. I know you don't like me. I know you don't trust me. And he said, but listen, I think Allison's going to die tomorrow. And then she gets very concerned. And I'm like, wait a minute. For a man you don't trust to say that about your best friend, that that should make you trust him less. Because you're like, are you going to kill her? (laughs) Yeah. But he, Um, but he, but he does clarify. He says, like, I'm worried for her. Yeah, he he does. He really does. He play. You know, he's still. Now the film is trying to like push us into the no 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 we know it's we know it's the cabal it's not the the evil boyfriend he's at least believing and people are believing each other and we don't need yeah. to belabor with like I don't believe you stuff at this yeah, point yeah, yeah. in the movie but that's when he says you know I think I know how to fix this or or what to do and I've got to go tonight we're gonna come to your party yeah she says she's like I can't take care of her again I have a party and he's like fine we'll come to your party and then you can take care of her while I go deal with shit at this house. Yeah, is basically the arrangement. Which I don't know what he's what what is he going to do at this house? Well, one he's going to walk around for fifteen minutes doing nothing, know, right? And just <laughs> so, wait till midnight. Yeah, he he kind of just dicks around for a little bit with a flashlight. Yeah. Um, 
he also has a gun from his glove compartment that he takes okay. with him. So he sneaks into the apartment and he's, I don't know which apartment room he's in, whose unit, but he, um, he finds a wall, a fake wall, and he br- busts it open. He finds a plaque engraved in the concrete that says, through me, you go into the city of grief, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. What does it mean, Cecil? <laughs> what does it mean? Well, it's a hellmouth. That's, it is that's, the hellmouth. It is what he, right. That's what's written on the gate of hell, apparently. Well, fortunately, because I didn't know, Father Halloran just shows up and goes, the entry to hell. He oh just clarifies God. it. It's so dumb. Meanwhile, his girlfriend is looking like death at uh-huh. this party. And yeah. even Jeff Goldblum with his fake Jeff Goldblum voice is like, what's happening with Allison? <laughs> And you're like, yeah, she probably should not have come to this party. I'm just saying this was a bad idea from the start. Yeah. Um, But she passes out again. And when, you know, they kind of put her in bed and they feed her some, some water. But then at the stroke of midnight, she has disappeared and she's out. She's on the run. Mm -hmm. And she's headed straight to to her old creepy apartment. Yep. Why she went there, I do not know. So... She uh, so w- while she's on her way, he Michael follows Father Halloran and the man in black all the way up to the fifth floor, and he's like, "Tell me, tell me what you mean, the uh, entry to hell. Tell me what's happening, I, or I'll strangle you." Yeah, to, and to the, this priest, to the blind priest, who is to this point not moved, not spoken, mm-mm. does it do anything? Does it respond to it? like just because he's blind doesn't mean he's catatonic, you know. It's very weird. And he starts the old, the priest just starts chanting in Latin yeah. and he starts choking him out. Michael just starts yeah, like choking this chokes motherfucker. him to the ground. And then a candlestick comes out of nowhere from a gloved hand and bops Chris or bops Michael on the head. Yeah. So Allison gets home and there's just like blood pouring down the stairwell. And she finds one of his bloody Girl. cufflinks that say MF or whatever his name was. You know what? I, at this point, this is the height, like we're in the crux of the, the climax, and I was still like, worth it to live in that apartment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally. Worth totally. it. So um, she starts to like pray for help. She realizes some shit's going yeah. big wrong more than just blood on the stairwell. Yeah. And she hears something coming, and she runs and hides in the closet. We get that mm-hmm. classic, like, just the yep. slat blinds of the closet and the light coming mm-hmm. through. And uh, door opens, almost a scream, but it's Michael. Yes. Michael's there in his suit. Yeah. But he's not talking like Michael because he starts yeah. talking about the angel Uriel. Yes. Was a guardian, a sentinel. Tonight, they're trying to make you the next sentinel. What? What? Whoa, 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 what? And um, he's like, they basically. But I'm just a model slash actress. I couldn't figure out here if Michael, because it's clear by the end of this movie, Michael is one of the Satan people. Yeah. But in this moment, he seems to be convincing her. He's telling her the evil plan of all the Satan people. He's like, what they're trying to do is make you kill yourself. Yeah. They want you to die by suicide so that you cannot become the next Sentinel. sentinel because you'll be condemned to hell for suiciding. And then... I, I just don't understand what his motivation here for like oh, revealing. Well, okay, the so evil I plan. read it as like he's dead, right? So, yeah. and I think it actually he says, but then again, it's his this this Michael suit, you know, uh-huh. think of it as Michael suit that Satan that the devil is like puppeting. Yeah, but I think they say because you all were fucking before you were married, and because he had a previous wife and you know got rid of whatever and, you know all that business, he has gone to hell. Therefore, he is now like Satan's lapdog. So he's just going to say whatever Satan wants him to say. But why would Satan want this? My question is, why would Satan tell her this? Because he's saying it in a way of like, he's talking about the angel Uriel being a guardian and a sentinel. And he's saying like, you're about to become the next sentinel. And everyone you've seen here are all reincarnations. They're all devils. And they can only stop you by making you, convincing you to commit suicide i think it's it's the classic devil uh devil's advocate negotiating tactic of listen this is what the good guys are gonna want you to do 
They want you to be the Sentinel. But look at that dusty old dude. He just sat in a chair for 50 years. But he does, never says leave. that, though. Like, no. He's he like, not, it's like, come with us and have fun. It's... I guess it was just Kill yourself a, and have I, fun with us. They never say that though. He's like, they can only stay these devils. Cause he calls them devils. Yeah. And he says, and then he also says, I was killed by father, whatever the man in black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And now I'm damned to hell for my sins, which yeah. include hiring Jim Brenner to kill my wife. Oh, yeah, That's right. <laughs> and, yeah. There you go. And so I didn't, I get, I guess this was just like the last burst of, Huh? The go the, this is the this is the ghost on his way to hell of michael is the only thing i could figure anyways Weird. motivation wise he is not making a good it it's not um james bond villain explaining the plot at the end yeah. you know it's not that it, i don't know anyways but i don't know why i'm hanging on this one thing that doesn't make sense because as soon as that happens uh -huh. then 50 people with physical disability yeah No, Jeffrey. Oh, there you go. Okay, there we go. There Hello. You are. Um, start that again. Fifty, the fifty people with. Oh, this is my internet. Why is my internet being crazy? Um, let's write it out. Um, you were starting yeah. with fifty people with disabilities. So then, like fifty people with disabilities just start walking into the room, mm -hmm. and they're not really menacing in any way. <laughs> They're Other just, than just having like facial deformities or whatever. They have facial deformities. And it's also like some of the, you know, like Beverly D'Angelo and she's wearing ghost makeup and, you know, like, like it's, it's, and some people are like, you don't know if you're looking at makeup or at like, you know, like what, if their face looks like that or, but it's, it's a, it actually kind of reminds me of the beyond in that it's a very odd and tepid version of hell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's just kind of like, like people that look different. Yeah, do you go to hell for having like a cleft yeah, palate? Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. I don't understand. But they're not they're not like raging or dancing on graves or doing anything like devilish. They're just sort of like shuffling along. But it's enough to make uh -huh. uh, uh it's, it's you know, and they're oh and she's up in the attic and she they kind of force her up into the attic and she sees the priest sitting in the or no, she sees she gets forced into the thing and Burgess Meredith is like giving her a knife now. He's like, you, saying, you be the queen in our kingdom. Like, listen, like we might be kooky, you know, but it, it's hell. Yes. But we're, you know, it's kind of fun, right? Just all you have to do is kill yourself. I don't know why. At this, reveal. Yeah. And I don't know why at this moment, if you're trying to make the Jesus. case to get somebody to join your group, you didn't, you know, listen, if you were trying to get me to join your group and you uh -huh. held a cat birthday party and played polka music. And had crazy old people shout weird shit. Probably show I'm up, more right? likely to join your group than if you showed up with a bunch of like people groaning like zombies and just meandering about the place that I don't know and there's no fun. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be queen of this kingdom. I want yeah, to be queen of the, the cat birthday, birthday birthday party kingdom. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, so then But then Jesus reveal. Father Halloran with the giant cross. And they can't and also, stop him. Oh my, oh my God. And and it's just this poor old guy. And he's like, you know, like with this gold cross. But then I kind of like this. There's a weird moment where it's like faces are coming at the camera. And and you can tell that the, the father Halloran is, mm -hmm. is overwhelmed. You know, he's starting to like lose his way a little bit. But then he makes it through. Don't worry. You know, oh, the light of Jesus uh -huh. will, will carry you uh -huh. through these benign people who were just have weird looking faces that's uh -huh. all not de not devils just just normal people who look different yep and sure enough holds up the cross and allison jesus high fives that cross she does and she fully she rejects she does no cat birthday parties mm -mm. all jesus for there are no cat Parker. birthday parties in heaven there aren't which is really disappointing now we have the epilogue and we see a, uh, a a wrecking ball tearing down this old building that we watched. And that brand new condo has gone up at 10 yep. Montague Terrace. Yes. And the and Miss Logan is now showing another young a couple a brand this brand new Brooklyn condo. Mm -hmm. 
She's like, there used to be this grubby old townhouse here. Now this brand new condo. So it's something modern. Modern. Um, there's, there's, you would be the only people here other than there's one woman who lives in 5A, but she's a recluse. She's no problem at all. She's a nun. Oh, and it's got a very, and, the, and then for whatever reason, cut to Allison, full nun gear, whited out face, but she's got the, like the white contact lenses that Father Halloran had the whole yeah. time. So I was like, does being the Sentinel make you blind? Or is she I don't... just wearing, no, she could just see hell and that like bl bl blanched her eyes or something. And is how many years in the future? Cause she also aged, like her age makeup oh, makes yeah, her look little... 40 years old or whatever. But when you're, when you're the guardian of a hell mouth, those grays that come down a little bit faster. You fast. <laughs> yeah. I also wondered why the Sentinel doesn't go speak to the people who get moved into this house oh, to be like, God, listen, right? You're going to see people here. I There's promise you I'm an old priest. Let me show you. No one else lives here. Check it out for yourself. If you start meeting people here other than me, get the fuck out. Yeah. The end. That's all there is to it. Like, As why you don't... Said, I, I think you summed it up in your 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 experience in, with, a, with a noisy Brooklyn neighbor. Call the cops. Call the Ghostbusters. Don't call me. <laughs> one of the two. Let's rate this movie. What do you say? Let's do. How approachable is this film if you're horror film averse on our Sasha scale? Uh, squeamish approachability scale for the horror of verse with one being the least approachable and 10 being really approachable. I would give the Sentinel seven cat birthday parties out of 10, maybe eight even it's more like, it's just more creepy than scary and, and often like ha ham handedly creepy. Like I will talk about like the, the father crossing the room is kind of a real spooky moment. There's a lot of spooky faces at the end. Uh, listen, your your miles may, mileage may vary on how spooky you find these faces. And I'm not talking about the deformities. I'm just talking about like the people with like the cataract eyes or like the white eyeballs staring at the camera or whatever. Um, there are a couple of like brief, super gory 70s practical effects scenes, like a nose getting cut off and an eyeball having like white goopy shit pour out of it. Um and then also trigger warnings for suicide being a major plot point in this whole fucking oh, yeah. movie. So, and the Catholicism is off the charts with this one. So let's go seven out of 10. I think it's really approachable. I think you'll find it very silly, but to the points that I brought up, maybe those will be touchier for some people than others. So uh, what do you think, Cecil, as a horror film? Uh, in the canon of horror films, I feel like this movie was made for me in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. So this movie taps, taps into a lot of things that I find very uh, enjoyable about horror films. Uh, it is, as I said, it is a bit of a knockoff of a of, of a knockoff of other horror films mm -hmm. of the of the, the the time period and of the genre. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to give this eight ballet lesbians. Perfect. Um, let's figure out what movie we will watch next. You have a scare die. I have a style die. We'll roll those up and see what movie matches both. So on your scare dial, so on your scare die, if you roll a one, our next movie has to have existential scare Two, alien three, a lady killer four, killer games, five evil science or six, a wild card, whatever scare we want, what you got. That's a five. Evil science. Ooh. Okay. That's fun. All right. So we're going to match up the evil science that you rolled with what I roll on the style die. If I roll a one, it's got to be a found footage movie. If I roll a two, action fantasy, something that skirts the horror a little bit. Three, a black and white film. Four, it's got to be body horror. Uh, five, uh, something from the last five years. Or if we roll a sixth, we put this down as 75th percentile, meaning it's got to have like a 75% or higher on one of your aggregator sites uh, as far as like quality review by viewers or critics. So let's roll up style. I have got a five. Last five years, existential. Ooh. We're going to have a lot there. I think I there's bet. going to be quite a few. Uh, okay, so... Let's get our own list pulled up and see what we got. And then we, we take can... a pee, pee break. Yeah, let's take, take a pee, pee break. break. Yeah. One second. For sure.
word word okay so exist should we start with our list and then we'll let's start with our list and then we'll get into uh yeah. what uh letterbox has There's a couple of these i threw on here skin of marink is a recent film woof uh yes. that is uh, i would say is more last five years than truly existential it depends on what your read of what's happening yeah. in this movie is um Another movie that we brought up on the show before is His House, no, which, which was, is this? this is a, uh, I saw this on, I think it's still on Netflix. This is a, um, it's made in Britain, but it is about two, it's about a couple that are immigrants uh, that are brought into Britain, basically on kind of a, a refugee sort of program. Sure. And they are brought into a scary fucking haunted place. Nice. Um, And what is haunting them is maybe something more than just haunting what? yeah what oh, no. can you imagine in a horror film we also have on here the lodge give me two seconds here sorry oh this one looks really interesting um this one's been on my uh on my radar for a minute and uh essentially uh okay during a family retreat to a remote winter cabin over the holidays, the father is forced to abruptly depart for work, leaving his two children in the care of his new girlfriend. Isolated and alone, a blizzard traps them inside the lodge as terrifying events summon specters from Grace's past. Fun. Uh, love that. Love that for them. Uh, another one that is directly, this is spot on with Existential and Last Five Years. I don't know if it's a movie we want to watch, but it's the movie Freaky which is like the modern horror adaptation of Freaky Friday sort oh, of thing. Like it's okay. playing off of the Freaky Friday principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a Vince Vaughn film for what that's worth. Uh, but Freaky is basically a, 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 a serial killer magically switches yep. bodies with a 17 year old girl. Uh Oh, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? But like deep, like purely existential because it is about what is existence. Yeah. <laughs> like little, who literally. are you? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this counts as existential, but it just seemed kind of weird, which maybe existential is a placeholder for 2020 okay. film called swallow. Okay. Um, Hunter, a newly pregnant housewife, finds herself increasingly compelled to consume dangerous objects. Woof. As her husband and his family tighten their control over her life, she must confront the dark secret behind her new obsession. So that's a thing. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> You're like, can I can I put that in my mouth and swallow it? No? Yep. Okay. Bird Box. I never saw Bird Box. This was a huge craze about four years ago. Oh, Bird Box. What is this one? Uh, Bird Box is a mysterious force, decimates the population, and only one thing is certain. If you see it, you die. Yeah. So, but it's got like an all-star cast, Sarah Paulson, John Malkovich, Sandra Bullock. This to me sounds like a, uh, I don't know if this came out around the same time as A uh, Quiet Place, but that it was like, if you hear it, time, or if you make yeah. noise, you die. This mm -hmm. is, if you see it, you die. Yeah. So one of those. It's very high concept. Yeah. Here's one I don't know much about is Color Out of Space, but it's uh this is an HP Lovecraft, which is going to be deeply existential. This one, uh, this is this is kind of of the um Nick Cage makes crazy horror movies uh mm -hmm. era of his career. Um, I think this one is might be it might be more space alien-y than it is existential Lovecraft. You know, like it's a Lovecraft, but I think it might be more sp spacey. Okay. But it probably has some existential questions in there as well. Right. Uh, Titan is a movie I've seen uh, existential in the sense of, uh, I guess, sort of in the way that any kind of like modern horror movie is sort sure. of existential. Um, it, it does become, I, I without spoiling it, like there is a, like just what what this person is and what they're made of oh. is kind of uh -oh. the question. Um it's not an important question. It's just part of the question. You're like, what is your existence made of? You're like, well, yeah, am, yeah. What, what drives you? Yeah, yeah. Midsummer, very yeah. existential. It's yeah. about life and the path, yeah. <laughs> path of life and what it means to clear the way. Um, I think another one that looks kind of like existential is uh, Bo is Afraid. That's the new Ari Aster film that just oh, came out. Oh yeah, this past month. why not? Um, 
So there's that. We've never done that for the show. We've never seen a movie in the theater. I know. For the show. I don't know if that movie's ex- existential, but I'm guessing with Ari Aster, it's very It probably so. is. Let's hit up our letterbox. Brave Crab brings us antlers. Okay. You no, know, have you seen this movie? No, I have no. not. Um, um, but it, I, it, I'm excited to watch it though. Yeah, I have. Uh, I have seen this movie. This is. Uh, I wish I could tell you a whole lot about it, <laughs> but it is existential and it involves okay. antlers, so maybe worth a rewatch. Okay. Um, Mad God. This is the stop motion animated picture that took forty something odd years for oh what's his head to make. Um, it's on Shutter. Um, it is from all accounts. I've not seen this movie, but it is by all accounts deeply fucked up. The only tagline is a figure known as the assassin descends from the heavens into a nightmarish pit full of monsters, titans, and cruelty. Yes. We're not going to get to all of these. I'm just going to point out because there's a lot listed on here and we don't have time to look up everyone and describe all of them. Um, so it's awesome folks who have thrown out a little description. Um, Milu Hu throws out a movie that I don't know is totally a horror film, but it's sorry to bother you. Yeah. Not exactly a horror film. It certainly contains very horrific elements. Horror, horror, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, hard somebody to else categorize mentioned, yeah, something yeah. Somebody else mentioned bonkers. don't look up. You know, oh, the what? sort of climate crisis, comedy. Of it, course. It, it is horrific in that these things are happening right now. I don't know if I would categorize these as horror films. No. But I like where your mind's thinking. Yes, yes, I do too. Um, so I would say oh, another one that that uh, got put out on here that I think would be interesting and does fit is uh, Jazakai uh, throughout the menu, which came out last year. Uh, because the menu... Vaguely existential. The thing I will say that it asks existentially is, are you artist or are you audience? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that's a deep, I think it has some deeply Are you existential servant? Are you master? Questions. Yeah. The scare isn't the existentialism though. Yeah. The um, scare is what you're willing to do to be servant or what you're willing to do to be master. Yeah, exactly. So a couple on here that I think are interesting. Um, always interested to add in the menu as you know just because i've always wanted to get to that the night house is one that i've heard great things about and would yep. like to see yeah, that's one yeah, you yeah. have seen though right cecil or have not no i have not you have not seen the night house um yeah i think that looks really interesting so night house is high on my list that came from a uh, brave crab no i'm sorry let me say that again the night house came from diamond dogs and a couple other people on here too so that's a good one uh i'm interested in skinnamarink for the show sure i'm interested in uh his house sounds really cool his house i'm interested in revisiting oh swallow Swallow sounds sounds really crazy Swallow sounds really fucking crazy as well i would be very interested in in trying again with ari aster and re-watching midsommar or even bo is afraid there's a new one out that you and i have not seen yet yeah like this will be the first time we get to go see a movie in the theaters although albeit separately but you know, uh, uh, at the time of recording, a truly up to date last five years film. Yeah. So, like, there's a lot of stuff on here, but that shines out as the only one, the only film that is like in movies right now, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, what do you think? So, we have the option to go see by the time this episode comes out, it won't be available for streaming yet, I don't think. And it might have been gone from local cinemas, but, um, it will. I think probably this summer is when it'll come out on HBO Max or whatever. But yeah, um, yeah, should we do the, should we go see a movie in the theater? Let's go back to the theaters, Jeffrey. Wow. You're going to make me watch a combination of a film that is by Ari Aster, Uh stars Joaquin Phoenix, and is three hours long. Yeah. This may be our final episode. (laughs) Okay. Well, it's been a good run. (laughs) At Uh, least you have Beverly D'Angelo masturbating in Scarlet Leotard. It's sort of like Breaking Bad, like the penultimate episode is the best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Cecil, for talking with me. And if you have thoughts on The Sentinel or ideas for other movies, there's a bunch of them that are existential horror from the last five years. Let us know on Twitter or Instagram at Random Horror 9. And watch, if you can, 
Bo is Afraid from this year with us this week. And come on back next Tuesday for a new episode. Have a restful night with no upstairs neighbor trying to turn you into a nun or nothing. Boo. Boo.